Sean is a fourth year medical student and is committed to medical ethics and community service. Prior to this, he attended the University of Houston where he attained a degree in history with a minor in biology. Student Dr. Hickey has matched into internal medicine at Freeman Hospital in Joplin, uh, but hopes to eventually return home to Texas. Um, so with that, I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Parker. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this chance to share this with you and for your time. Um, Let's see. Uh, my thesis is about an argument for a change in U.S. policy. Um, I'll try to make this case for you uh, how we should try to enact a, a regulated and systematic compensation for live organ donor compensation. Uh, quickly, my decorations, I have none. Um, and uh, this presentation uh, it reflects only my stance and no one else I'm associated with. So as many of us already know, the burden of end-stage organ disease is daunting. Over 100,000 uh, people are currently waiting uh, for an organ to save their lives. Uh, almost every year, there is a percent increase in people on the waiting list, and most of, the, most of those are in need of a kidney. Um, less than a quarter uh, will receive the organ they're waiting for. And I think most uh, pointedly, every day, 17 people die waiting for an organ on the transplant list. COVID clearly has made a, uh, an impact on this, has caused a decrease in transplantations because of uh, delays in surgeries, questions about whether patients with COVID were eligible to donate. And so last year um, in 2021, we were able to increase the number of transplants to 24,000, which is really just us recovering lost ground from the previous two years. So because of the greater point of my thesis was to propose a change in U.S. policy, uh, we need to address what that policy is and how it was made. So in the U.S., as I'm sure uh, many of us, but not all of us are aware, we opt into being an organ donor uh, in case that we are dying or potentially dying or declared brain dead. Uh, and we also have prioritization on our donor list um, based on objective clinical findings, or um, if you are a, a living donor who has already donated an organ, you are given priority if you're in the situation where you need a kidney or an organ in the future. Um, we are a uh, mandated choice country where when you get an ID or a driver's license, you're required to make a choice about whether you want to be an organ donor. Um, and then finally, the only legal form of living donor in the United States is as an altruistic donor, someone who, do, who does not have any uh, form of payment or compensation for donating their organ. Many countries have different policies like opt-out lists versus opt-in, different forms of prioritization, and some of them compensate their donors. Um, but this is our law uh, around organ procurement and transplantation. We got this back in 1984, the National Organ and Transplant Act. Uh, historically, though, we've been able to perform organ transplants since like the 50s and 60s. So why was this policy made in the 80s? Um, in walks to history, a man named H. Barry Jacobs. Here's this handsome son of a gun. So Dr. Jacobs, MD, lost his license pretty early on uh, in his practice due to insurance fraud and in turn started to make a living as an expert witness in trials, and he wrote a book on malpractice lawsuits. Um, and in the early 80s, he came up with this idea and started a company, subtly named the International Kidney Exchange Limited. His plan was to purchase kidneys from living donors in America and the global south, and then he would sell them to potential recipients suffering from kidney disease in America. His plan was to pay about $1,000 for a kidney and then sell it for about $5,000 and he would pocket the difference. Uh, he was quoted in newspapers at the time in saying regarding uh, organ transplants, quote, where is the wind blowing? It's the money wind, end quote. Very charming individual. So at one point he approached the state of Virginia where he lived to see if Medicare and Medicaid would pay potential US citizen organ donors so he wouldn't have to and uh, which was quickly met with a state law outlawing all sale of human organs. Uh, several states followed suit as the story of H. Barry Jacobs grew, and um, a little known representative from Tennessee named Al Gore championed the National Organ Transplant Act, uh, which would, it outlawed the sale of organs, but at the same time it allowed charitable organizations to manage organ procurement and transplantation nat nationally and regionally. They accomplished all of this with a very particular assumption about the near future of organ transplantation. Back in 1984, uh, there are hearings about testimony, as I'm sure we're, some of us are aware from C-SPAN, when Congress people give their vote, uh, they're allowed to speak. And so uh, records at the time show that policymakers assumed that deceased organ donor pro procurement would reach such levels in the near future, we would not require much or at all any live organ donation just in general. 
there were there was one notable dissenting voice at the time. Thankfully, it was Dr. Roger W. Evans, PhD, who was a uh, published expert on organ transplantation. So um, at the time when the voting was uh, being passed in, Al Gore made an interesting proposal as a law was, uh, was uh, becoming into practice. If, organ, if cadaveric organ donations alone could not handle the burden of end organ disease in the US, quote, the government, a governmental entity or des designated charity could underwrite or offer in-kind rewards such as contribution to a donor's retirement fund or income tax credit or tuition vouchers, roughly $50,000 US. So, whereas the policy itself was clearly a, a, a very historical reaction to H. Barry Jacobs' attempts at being a, an organ broker, um, it was understood at the time that changes might have to be made in the future regarding living organ donation. So I would love to go on about organ donation policies around the world, but that's not what inspired me to write this thesis or give this presentation. What inspired me to write this thesis was the realization that transplanting a donated organ um, uh, in that practice, everyone benefits from the donation of the organ except for the donor and the United States. The recipient clearly gets a new lease on life. The family and the community around the recipient gets to continue to enjoy this person in their lives. Um, surgeons and physicians and healthcare providers all bill the recipient or the, reci uh, or the recipient's insurance. Insurance company pays for this because, especially in the case of kidney transplants, the transplant pays for itself in the first two to three years just by stopping the need for dialysis. Uh, and then also, if a recipient can work or pay an insurance company post-transplantation, the insurance company can stand to gain another paying customer. So just to prove this point, um, as you can see, let me see if I can get my pointer without shutting this all down. No. Okay. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see that uh, kidney dialysis costs about $40,000 and $70,000 per year. Um, that is in-center uh, hemodialysis. Um, it's also showing home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. But on the right-hand side, the last right two bar graphs show that transplantation and medical care costs for recipients in the first year of surgery is comparative of $70,000 to $90,000 that year. And after the first year of having the transplant, their costs plummet downwards to $16,000 to $30,000 mostly for um, anti-rejection medication. The total cost of a transplantation procedure is almost half a million dollars, which is mostly made up of the donor and the recipient's hospital admission, surgery, outpatient care, et cetera. The out-pocket cost for recipients is about $30,000 if they're insured. Um, this number is not on the screen, but I wanted to grab your attention um, and say that in regards to public health policy, the net lifetime healthcare savings of a kidney transplant is about $100,000. Every time you do a transplant, everybody saves kind of as, as a society $100,000, which as we kind of go forward, this means that compensating a live organ donor any amount less than $100,000 still results in lifetime healthcare savings. So how much does the living donor actually stand to lose other than a kidney or a lobe of their liver or other things that can be denoted while you're still alive? Um, the organ donors, the, sorry, the recipient's insurance pays for the donor's testing, screening, procedures, and hospitalization. But even though that all this is paid for by the recipient's insurance, this fails to cover the actual the total cost incurred by the donor for donating life. Research shows that live organ donors incur a direct financial cost from $2,000 to $5,000, usually from time off work, child care, home maintenance, transport, parking, and lodging. Many transplant centers try to provide lodging and parking vouchers and try to minimize the days for screening and evaluation. But even these programs can only get it down about two to three days of nonstop lab testing and doctor visits, which sometimes extra lab days can be added on. There can be hiccups in the process. I'm sure we can all easily imagine trying to do 12 doctor's visits in two days. So afterwards though, so you, you've donated a kidney, you're, you're a live organ donor. Um, your, uh, the recipient's insurance only pays for the first year of complications from the surgery. And anything after that is no longer covered. Um, also, live organ donors faced uh, other difficulties. 7% experienced difficulty in attaining health insurance. 25% experienced difficulty in getting life insurance. These include denial of coverage, delays in coverage, higher costs, more paperwork. Um, financial assistance is available for some donors, but the financial assistance for an organ donor is based upon the income of the recipient not the donor. And this is also based on a poverty line. So many donors do not even bother trying to get assistance. 
So finally, as we all agree that there's, you know, uh, to financially support donors more, how much money is in the organ procurement and transplant industry anyway? Um, to put it bluntly, global estimates are about shy of $90 billion. For an or national scope, I took a look at um, organ procurement organizations in our country and was able to find uh, records for 36 out of 57 of them. To, to look, at, look at those tax records, it shows that they have a total revenue of $2.2 billion. 97% of that is from service revenue for organ procurement and transplantation. Bear in mind that uh, OPOs or organ procurement organizations do not usually help with live organ donors. They work more with uh, decimate organ donors. Um, there are not numbers like these for the 252 transplant centers that work with live organ donors. Um, so we know that life, you know, life-saving donors, these heroes, these people who give up themselves to save another, are losing thousands of dollars with uh, while healthcare providers bill for services, insurance benefits from lifetime savings. My thesis supports enacting a regulated systematic process of compensation for living organ donors. By not allowing anyone to be a broker for an organ sale, but instead compensating a donor with financial assistance, health insurance, life insurance, state college tuition, job counseling, any number of things that the government and insurers are already capable of giving folks, we stand to save lives of tens of thousands of people by allowing that if we support living donors, we'll increase organ donations. So I would like to conclude, conclude with the ethics of this. Uh, not, I'm sure many of you are already thought about whether or not compensating an organ donor is the right thing to do. Historically, we have not done it. Uh, many have asked whether or not giving money or benefits would end up exploiting and coercing the economically disadvantaged, influencing people to donate just for the money. Um, critics of living organ donation often claim that those who suffer from poverty will be coerced to give up the organ um, for the promise of money and benefits. But the use of coercion assumes that the burden of poverty totally takes away a person's autonomy for medical decisions. And we do not and hope we never do um, suspend medical decision making uh, for someone due to their social economic status. Um, in addition, considering the multiple dimensions of what makes up the reality of poverty, would these gifts raise anybody up from poverty is another thing that's raised. Um, I am not proposing a policy change to address poverty at large, thereby any policy change that I'm recommending would probably be very bad at it. Um, so compensating donors does not serve to solve poverty. What it does is to provide a, a cost neutral way to increase organ donations, decrease financial costs to donors and alleviate suffering for those with end stage organ disease. Um, here's an important distinction. Um, by proposing uh, my form of compensation, no recipients would be paying donors and I wouldn't want any organ brokers like those that would, you know, that have and currently do victimize people. Um, the government insurers or private insurers uh, give a gift to the donor in an approved effort to not exploit donors. We currently have a system that makes donors pay for the privilege of organ donation. Um, this would be a, a form of beneficent reciprocation. Um, that, and we do this all the time in our society. We pay property taxes to have funding for schools. We give tax breaks for charitable donors. By regulating the gift, we avoid purchasing and profiteering and thereby prevent exploitation. Um, now to address the ethics around our recipients, there's a lot of concerns about the, uh, would compensating donors, would they, you know, uh, would it increase procedure costs, potentially making this life-saving process uh, only for those of means uh, to attain. Um, we already mentioned that organ transplant is already quite costly. Many people in the US and probably in both rooms would find it hard to get money together for the average $30,000 up front just for the transplant surgery. I think the uh, fixing the problem of medical costs is outside the scope of my proposal. Um, would offering compensation to donors who are in need cause them to lie about their medical history, putting a recipient and a donor at risk? So currently donors undergo what I talked about that grueling screening and exam process, but the majority of folks uh, actually do not make it to be living donors when you start this process. Um, they, it's usually because of comorbidities uh, or risk of comorbidities in the future based off your family history and labs that they already uh, collected. There are infectious disease lab tests right up until the surgery happens as, as mandated by uh, the people who, who do these things. I believe that the medical infrastructure that we currently have around organ transplants is more than capable of continuing to protect our recipients and our donors. Um, would compensating live organ donors decrease altruistic and uh, deceased donors? The entire proposal 
is to compensate organ donors. I think it's hard to imagine a altruistic organ donor waiting for their chance to save someone's life, to be a hero, uh, turning up their noses at the idea of compensation. Uh, regarding deceased organ donation, I do not see how this would take place. Uh, right now, if everybody in the country were to make themselves an organ donor, um, we still would have an organ transplant list. We are attempting to change this policy to increase organ donation and support donors as, as soon as possible. The number of deceased donors uh, that we are able to procure from is increasing, but only by a little more than a percentage point each year. Other countries have adopted pro-donor prioritization and compensation ha and have only seen um, all their deceased organ donation increase at the same rate over time. Um, we address non-maleficence by decreasing the suffering of the recipient and offer an ultimate answer to social justice in the organ transplant list. You decrease scarcity that requires the existence of the list. Now, potential harms to our society. Um, a lot of these are kind of proposed as um, supposed harms to uh, what would almost be um, guaranteed benefits. Uh, would the would the perception of paying people for their organs cause people to lose faith in the government and the medical system? I think if we change the policy where we met the increasing organ donation needs, um, this would possibly affect the lives of people with end-stage organ disease and their family members and their community. I don't think I would, I, I, they would see a system that is actually willing to do more for them than what they're currently doing now. Finally, I, I think most people feel that when we talk about compensating organ donors is, is how it looks, how it makes you feel, what it symbolizes. For many of us, the, for the arguments I'm putting out, I am advocating for money going to organ donors and how is that not selling an organ or making a part of a human person a commodity? When you give money to newlyweds, does it cheapen their wedding? Um, when, when our tax dollars go towards first responders or military members for their service, do we take that into account before we thank them for their service? Are volunteer firefighters somehow better than paid firefighters? My proposal is for regulated systematic compensation for live organ donors uh, is to thank donors for their heroism, heroism and their sacrifice. They don't have to take it, but currently our society shows them that they aren't worth more than celebrating by words and thoughts alone. Uh, my proposal is to change that, to have a symbol that shows that we are truly value, we truly value their heroic act of giving a piece of themselves to another person. Thank you all very much for your time. Okay, Sean, you've given us a lot to think about and I, I think we have time for a couple of questions, but I can just, uh, let's be careful not to ask questions that will take uh, three or four hours to discuss. I'll do my best. Okay. Hey there, Sean. Uh, I think this certainly could take hours to discuss, uh, but I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, interesting topic, certainly with a lot of stakeholders involved. I'm wondering if in your research you came across an international country as similar to the U.S. as possible who's made such a policy change and wondering if you could use that to study uh, some of the potential ramifications that you outlined. So there, there are a few that directly compensate donors. Uh, I believe the one, the most, um, I think Singapore does live organ donor compensation that is directly tied to the costs associated with the donation. Um, Iran has had a policy for about 30 years, um, and I could go on and on about Iran's policy that uses government, um, charitable organizations, and the recipient's family to kind of fundraise and then give money directly to a directly to a donor. Um, and in Iran, uh, notably, they have a transplant donor wait list. They do not have a transplant recipient wait list. Um, it's tricky bringing up Iran, um, especially the very uh, very long historical context behind that policy and what it actually uh, what it actually means for folks on the ground but those are just some of the people but man Netherlands um, I know I'm pretty sure Wales uh, China a lot of countries have um, approached this policy with change and they have seen growth in donation numbers hey Sean thanks for the thought-provoking uh, presentation I think this is a great idea first of all I'm a big proponent of it, because as you mentioned, hospitals stand to gain so much money from these procedures, and they do benefit off of the altruism of these kind individuals willing to, to give up their organs. But my big question, big question is, 
you know, in terms of implementing something like this, have you thought about where will this money come from? Because that is, in my eyes, the biggest barrier to instituting something like this in, in the U.S. Who's going to pay for it? So I think the, the two easiest stakeholders who stand to gain from this are our biggest insurers, um, either that be the U.S. government through Medicare, Medicaid, or through private insurers. Um, they're clearly the ones who stand to gain the most from the savings, being the longstanding insurance providers. Um, if you look at, I mean, like just to kind of give you a glimpse, uh, as far as when I talk about the, the organ procurement organizations, if you take 10% of their revenue and give it to the organ donors from back in 2020, that is, um, that would be about $38,000, which would cover their costs and compensate them. Um, other researchers, uh, McCormick at all also recommended about $35,000, um, I think the the idea of the the long game as far as who are the people who are involved in public health and public health spending, those are the people who you would uh, who would take money from or other stakeholders who are who are also saying the benefit. Um, but it would be I feel like it would be pretty hard to pass uh, anyone to kind of tax the charitable organizations that run our organ procurement organization now, which is why I feel like the insurers, um, both public and private have the resources to give to people like health insurance and life insurance. These are things they just, they make, they create it. And so they would be in the position to just give it to somebody. Um, you, if you want to, I'm sure Sean would be glad to discuss this with any of you who want to contact him. So you guys know how to do that. So if you want to know more about this, just contact him and you can Zoom with him. Oh, I'd love that. Thank you. 